Guten Tag. Welcome to Midas Letter Live for this Tuesday, July 31st, 2018. If you're wondering who my co-host is here, this is actually Special Ed. Today he's very special. I accidentally touched him. He was supposed to turn to gold, but he turned to stone. Um, so I might have to paraphrase for Ed occasionally. He's, uh, he's not looking very talkative. Ed, can you turn around and face the audience a little bit? There, close up on Ed. Ed is uh, taking the form of Plato, and so we're going to have wise thoughts from Ed today on the cannabis space, on the copper space, on the oil and gas space, and on space in general. Because Ed, at the end of the day, has become a space-traveling, dead philosopher. Anyways, Ed, what have you got to say for yourself? He's not talking to me. Damned if I'm going to talk to a little stone statue. Do you like our new little Plato statue? That's Plato. In case you don't know, who was Plato? I don't remember. Some guy who said smart things. Anyways, have a hell of a show for you today. I mean, a hell of a show. We have uh, Justin B. Marshall is going to report to us from a dispensary operation in Monterey, California. We have, uh, let's see, who else do we have? We have, um, boy, my mind goes blank at the most inconvenient times. You'd think I'd remember this stuff. We have... OGI, Greg Engel is here from uh, Organogram Holdings to talk about his Q3 earnings. And then we have Emerald Health is also here. We're going to talk to Chris Wagner, the CEO of Emerald Health. And uh, we might even throw in somebody else, but I doubt it. We're also going to have a small contest with you audience people. I'm going to uh, improvise a 15 second uh, video clip that we're going to put on our subscribe page to get more people to subscribe and uh, theoretically that will result in more people subscribing. Anyways, we have a strange phone ringing. Don't mind that. We'll find out who it is. Strange phones everywhere. Anyways, today in the news, Afria announced that they have secured a 25 million dollar debt financing from WFCU Credit Union. This is the second round of debt financing secured from WFCU. They previously did $25 million in a five-year loan announced May 9th, 2017. They haven't specified where the non-dilutive raise will be will used, but it will contribute towards executing on their long-term strategic global expansion plans. Now, tomorrow, tomorrow, right at the top of the the top of the show, we're going to have Vic Newfeld here. And Vic is going to tell us about something that's going to be part of his press release tomorrow. And we think it's pretty big news. Do you think, and this is just speculation on my part, that it could be the announcement of a Fria and Molson Coors entering into either an investment agreement, a joint venture of sorts, who knows? This is all speculation at this point. Vic will be here tomorrow to flesh that out. Brad Rogers is going to be here later in the week. He's the Chief Operating Officer and President of CanTrust. Uh, who else are we going to have this week? We have just a revolving door of cannabis industry luminaries. Continuing with the news, Canopy Growth Corporation, the only NYSE-listed Canopy company, announced their shareholders approved their omnibus incentive plan at their special meeting of shareholders. The resolution authorizes Canopy to divide the number of issued and outstanding common shares of a range between two for one and three for one at the, the discretion of the board of directors. So this is essentially a forward split of Canopy's stock. To me, this is interesting because one of the great value propositions inherent in Canopy Growth shares relative to Aurora's was the fact that they had such a low share is issuance relative to a portfolio of assets. And so the compressed implied value per share extrapolated from the assets as they matured would be much greater and the performance therefore much higher than would be say Aurora's who has far greater shares out in a similar asset mix. So this kind of blurs the line between Canopy and Aurora in my view and undermines to some degree 
the value proposition for owning Canopy over Aurora. Now, what are the strategic reasons for Canopy wanting to forward split their stock on a two or three for one basis? Going to be a lower share price. There is a perception in some circles that that implies a higher level of uptake and accumulation by other, by other participants. Higher share prices being typically associated with more exclusive and larger capital pools. Now that could make sense. Uh, that might actually drive up the performance of the shares post split. Uh, what other reasons could there be? There are, there are numerous and we will be talking to various guests over the week about the advisability of that and how it actually is going to play out for shareholders. Ultimately, we're going to have a ringside seat as we watch both Aurora and Canopy and Afria and Kronos and Organogram and MedMen and every cannabis company that is listed in Canada vies for market share in a death spiral to the bottom as the competition and the price of cannabis starts to swallow them all and there will be only two or three standing as none of them can raise any more money. I didn't even eat any cannabinoids today, if you can believe that. Anyways, the, uh, the uh, Delta 9 Cannabis trading on the TSX venture under symbol NINE announced that they've signed a memorandum of understanding with Nanosphere Health Sciences, which itself trades on the CSE under the symbol NSHS. This MOU will grant a master license to Nanosphere's patented technology to Delta 9 for all of Canada. The Nanosphere delivery system aims to provide more bioavailability in comparison to other methods of delivery by transporting essential ingredients directly to the bloodstream and cells. The exact mechanics of that are not clear to us at this point, but this is one of the segments of the cannabis industry that could be viewed as the next generation of companies, those that are focused on life sciences applications of cannabinoids X of consuming cannabis directly or for recreational purposes. And this is one of the industries that I think is going to put the sort of long tail on the whole cannabis phenomenon in terms of the, the bubble or the mania that now dominates cannabis assets is going to make it something to watch because it's going to keep on going. It'll be the gift that keeps on giving. What do you think of that, Ed? Ed, turn around. I'm talking to you. Ed's not talking to me. <laughs> Actually, get out of here, Ed. Lexaria Biosciences Corp, CSE, LXX, and Hill Street Beverage Company. Now here's a great symbol, TSX Venture listed beer, B-E-R, B-E-E-R. You'd think I'd know how to spell beer. Huh. Jointly announced they've signed a definitive agreement to license Lexaria's Dehydra Tech TM. What is that? Hill Street Beverage Company will now produce a line of cannabis-infused alcohol-free beverages for Canadian distribution following regulatory approval. The key being regulatory approval. You cannot, at this point, sell beer that's infused with any cannabinoids. So, a bit of a leap of faith has to happen there. Crop Infrastructure Corp. Now, who we've been following at the behest of one of our regular viewers, has announced that they have entered into a joint venture agreement to have a 49% interest in a zero cost lease of a 217,000 square foot property. The five acres of agricultural land has been secured in some of the most fertile land in Jamaica. Population 3 million, Jamaica. I don't get it. I don't see what the rush is for Jamaica. 3 million people there. What's the big deal? The company is in the process of identifying a suitable tenant license, licensee for the project. Hmm, that's interesting. Crop plans to license the brand Hempire Jamaica to the tenant has acquired the domain HempireJamaica.com. Okay. Abcan Global Corporation, TSX Venture listed ABCN, announced that they're going to acquire 100% of the outstanding shares of Canna Farms. Canna Farms was first licensed in BC and has been cultivating for, has many years of cultivation experience. The acquisition triples AB Can Abcan's current capacity to provide key supply in a potentially undersupplied market. Hmm. We don't know where Barry Fishman is going with that. We hope that he will come in and talk to us again and explain that. That does sound like it might be potentially impactful, but perhaps not. Radiant Technologies, remember this company is owned in large part by, or at least is an investee of Aurora 
Cannabis has announced that they've closed a bot deal financing for $24.9 million, the proceeds of which they're going to use to upgrade the company's Edmonton extraction line for their dedicated hemp extraction and purification and for additional capacity in America and or Europe. Now this is interesting because being in Edmonton, they're going to be right around the corner from Aurora's Aurora Sky Facility. Oh my God, it's instant offtake. Good God, what's happening? In an effort to differentiate itself from the emerging cannabis market in Canada, Puff Ventures, CSE listed PUF, announced that they partnered with Casey Howling to use science-based vegetative propagation to produce their cannabis. Vegetative propagation is used to produce plants with the same genetic material and are essentially clones of the parent plant. This is essentially what we call tissue culture. Now, because we didn't have a show yesterday, I'm gonna run through some of the news yesterday. We're gonna skip the organogram piece because we have this interview with Greg coming up in four minutes, we'll call it. Um, but they had a great third quarter. Uh, Aurora Cannabis yesterday announced they've obtained their Health Canada dealer, dealer's license for their Aurora Mountain facility in Alberta. That's the small one that they've been operating out of. The new license will allow Aurora additional opportunities to produce and sell cannabis oils and future novel derivative products from Aurora Mountain. The license also provides additional opportunities to transport cannabis products for import and export to international markets. Scythian Biosciences Corp, which is about to be renamed Seoul Global Investments Corp, TSX Venture listed SCYB, announced that they've signed a letter of intent to acquire CanCure Investments Inc. Not to be confused with Canacure, the company that was just recently announced in a takeover LOI with Heritage Cannabis. Boy, this is really getting confusing with all these Canna and Cure names involved. Anyways, CanCure is an Ontario corporation in the process of acquiring an interest in Florida-based health and wellness medical organization. Closing of the acquisition is expected to occur around October 15th, 2018. Village Farms yesterday and Emerald Health announced that they've, their 50-50 joint venture for Pure Sun Farms has received its cannabis sales license from Health Canada. Now recall that Pure Sun Farms is 1 million acres of Village Farms, 5 million acre, uh, 5 million square foot rather, not acre, 5 million acres, that would be huge. Pure Sun Farms is the joint venture that is the 1 million acres out of Village Farms, 5 million square feet rather, 1 million square feet out of 5 million square feet that they are going to grow cannabis for, for uh, for the joint venture with Emerald Health Therapeutics. Ugh. Seniors moment kicking in here. Quinsum Capital Corporation, CSE listed QCA, announced their intention to proceed with repurchase of six million shares, call it, of its common shares. They think the current market price of its common shares may not fully reflect the underlying value of the company's business and future prospects. So the repurchase is in the interests best interest of its shareholders. Hmm, let's see, using the treasury to buy back shares because you don't like your share price generally indicates you don't have a better idea or there's just a shortage of good investments. Anyways, we'll see how that pans out for them, but the, bill, the, bill, bleh, the bid will increase the respective proportionate shareholdings and equity interest of all remaining shareholders. That's looking on the bright side. Nutritional High International, CSE listed EAT, has officially launched an innovative cannabis awareness program called, named FlySafe. FlySafe focuses on promoting responsible cannabis consumption and cannabis education via sourced research specifically targeting cannabis advocates. I'm a cannabis advocate, FlySafe, doesn't make any sense to me. Currently the FLA Safe website is live at flysafe.org, FlySafe being spelled F-L-I, S-A-F-E. Traditional High also announced that it closed its previous acquisition of Pasa Verde LLC in California. Pasa Verde, founded in 2017, operates a leading cannabis extraction and toll processing facility in Sacramento, California. Phi Vida Holdings, CSE listed VIDA announced they have, they've approved their graduate or they've been approved for graduation to the OTCQS Best Market 
as a foreign issuer with full DTC eligibility now in process. That's going to make it a lot easier for U.S. investors to buy it on a U.S. exchange, in case you're wondering what the significance of that might be. The company's common shares are scheduled to commence trading on the OTCQX under the symbol PHBAF. And yesterday also Alifia Health, remember this was formerly Cannabo, TSA, TSX Venture listed ALEF announced that they've closed a previously announced acquisition of a modern, fully automated 160,000 square foot greenhouse in the Niagara region. Renovations at the facility are already underway, with the facility expected to be retrofitted and licensed before the end of 2018, with first harvest expected spring 2019. There is the news of the day, and now we're going to cut to this pre recorded conversation I had earlier. Hey, welcome back to Midas Letter Live. My guest in this segment is Greg Engel. He's the CEO of Organogram Holdings, trading on the TSX Venture under the symbol OGI. Greg, welcome back. Thanks for having me again, James. Greg, you just released third quarter results. Give me an update. What do you think? Well, a couple key things. I mean, great, a great quarter for us and really some exciting things in there. I mean, I guess one of the keys would be that, uh, you know, we continue to see due to our record yields, our cost of goods continue to come down. So, you know, our strategy as a major indoor producer or premium product um, has gone forward and has been very well accepted in terms of preparing for the adult rec market. But at the same time, we've driven down costs. So our cash costs right now uh, for the quarter reported were 66 cents and then an all-in cost, including amortization, down to 80 cents, which we believe is, you know, um, one of the best in the marketplace, whether or not you're a greenhouse or indoor producer. And we're showing as a major indoor producer, we can actually compete with uh, the greenhouses or maybe potentially be better. Um, I haven't seen any numbers that have come out better than what we presented today. Yeah, I always find it interesting when people try to differentiate a greenhouse from indoor because every greenhouse I've been in, I've been indoors. And right. so it's just glass True. walls versus <laughs> other walls. So yeah, well, that's interesting. That strikes me as uh, among the lowest uh, costs, all in cost per gram production of the whole sector. Yeah, it is. And I think what, you know, what's really driving it is, again, our record yields is a big factor, but also our efficiency, right? I mean, you've been to our facility a few months mm -hmm. ago, and you've seen what we're doing, not only from our unique three-tier production, but also how we're managing our plants, how we're treating each of the strains very differently, uh, and how we're processing as well, right? And that's all having an impact in terms of keeping our costs down and allowing us to continue to really produce a premium product, but at the same time at a, you know, at a, at a very low cost, which is phenomenal for the marketplace. Sure. So, so you're all set for the recreational market in October. You've got shelf space in Nova Scotia. Yeah, our agreements to date. So uh, we've got agreements that we've announced in New Brunswick, PEI, Manitoba, and Alberta. And we're actively pursuing agreements right now in Ontario, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. Hmm. And then potentially with private retailers uh, in Saskatchewan, because certainly individual retailers in Saskatchewan are, are uh, looking to kind of sign agreements. So uh, we expect those agreements to be in place in the not too distant future. Um, but again, I, we can't comment on whether or not we're, you know, we've gotten an agreement or not. Right. They're target markets right. for us, right? So certainly we're really positioned. But also, we've been building up inventory. I mean, that's one of the key as our yields continue to grow up, uh, go up in terms of where we're at. Uh, we're well positioned to be able to meet that demand when the market launches. We expect first shipments to happen in September mm -hmm. uh, as both the Crown Corps and the private retailers are looking to kind of stock shelves and prepare for an October 17th launch. So, uh, and we're well positioned in terms of, you know, our total production capacity. Great news for us as well is, you know, not only has our phase two been online since February, but our phase three, which can't start to come online in June, we'll start to get our first harvest in August. So we'll actually have product from our phase three, which brings our total production capacity up to 36,000 kilos right now. So uh, on an annual basis. So we're in a great position for launch the market and we're going to be in a great position to supply the market with a premium indoor product going forward. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to trying the recreational product. <laughs> <laughs> um, the advent of Doug Ford claiming that he's going to make the whole Ontario market, which arguably is the largest market in Canada, uh, privatized. Does that in your view, represent an extraordinary opportunity relative to the alternative of supplying it through the Liquor Control Board? Well, from what I understand so far from media reports is that still the OCS is going to play a role and they're primarily going to be, um, if media reports are correct, uh, going to be the mail order of supply as well as the wholesaler. And I, you know, I do believe potentially there are still going to be some government-run stores. I don't know for sure because we haven't had a final confirmation. <coughs> All we've heard out of some of the announcements is that there is a plan to look forward to private. 
Um, I think from a market opportunity, I think it's very unique. And one of the challenges is going to be that to be ready for October, we know those private stores aren't going to be up and running, right? So what is that time frame? Uh, so Ontarians are going to have to primarily rely on mail order for, you know, uh, I'd say through the end of this year in most cases. Um, so that's going to be a bit of a challenge from a launch perspective. But I think going forward, it does present some opportunities. It's certainly from a government perspective, they don't have to put the capital resources in and they're going to be relying. But it's yet to be determined which model they're going to follow. Is it going to be, you know, an Alberta model with, uh, you know, with, uh, with a series of, uh, you know, an almost unlimited number of suppliers? Or is it going to be a Manitoba model where you've kind of picked a uh, number of key suppliers. But I think at the end of the day, you know, it's, you know, I think on one hand, it's unfortunate we've seen OCS and we'd seen their plans and what the stores look like. Mm -hmm. And they were very focused on training their staff and making sure the experience was one that consumers walked out with a very positive. Um, so we'd ideally like to see a mix of those OCS stores and some private retailers at the same time, because they'll both bring a different experience. So. Sure. And uh, your branding strategies, you seem to be sort of ahead of the curve on that as well with the differentiated brands, the Trailer Park Buds, the Anchor Organics, and then of course the Edison Cannabis. Are you finding that the uptake from your existing client base is appreciating the rebranding and sort of on side with that, or are they exposed to it at this point? Yeah, so I mean, they're certainly exposed to it, but one of the keys that all the provincial jurisdictions and the federal program is relying upon is that you're going to have different brands in terms of the rec market and the medicals, right? So uh, it's key that you have different brands, and I think you know it's important from a messaging perspective that you do separate. We did test the Edison um, brand in the medical market as the Edison project by OGI to see where consumers looking for you know a premium handcrafted hand trim. And, um, you know, high terpene profile product. And now we're transitioning that product into the Edison Cannabis Company and the reserve version of that as well. Hmm. Um, so far, the response to our branding has been phenomenal, both from, you know, the public retailers, the, you know, the, the Crown Corp stores, as well as the private retailers, and at some of the conventions and consumer events that we've seen. So, you know, for example, at Lyft and some of the other conferences, we've seen phenomenal response from the potential consumers to our, uh, our brand strategy. Yeah, so there is a l large demand for premium, high terpene, high, C or high THC content, bud. Absolutely, and I mean, we we have a you know a partnership with a company in Colorado called the Green Solution. So we have an understanding of kind of what their sales uh, look like, and you know, four years in, we saw um, product supply out out. Um, pace demand this year, uh, kind of at the end of last year, and we know that there's been some price compression on the low end, but certainly from a premium flower perspective, and that's why we made a decision to really focus on indoor production, is that uh, they're still sustaining a $14 per gram price in Colorado, even when there's uh, you know an oversupply in the market, and it's that oversupply is impacting the kind of lower end product, certainly. Sure. But the higher end product retains its high margin. It does. And I think, you know, because uh, again, and I think that's where we're uniquely positioned. It's really only ourselves um, and Kronos and Canopy to some degree that have really kind of continued to expand with uh, large indoor facilities. Uh, although Kronos recently announced they're also adding a greenhouse. So uh, I, I think with our cost of goods and producing, you know, a premium product at a low cost really puts us in a great position for this marketplace. Yeah, you bet. The. Uh the onset of the recreational rules is, uh, you know, in October. Will that start to show up on balance sheets in calendar Q4, or will it sort of have to wait and see until Q1? Yeah, what we're going to see, so all the discussions that we've been having with the various provinces that we have agreements with or promises that we're looking to target agreements with is they're expecting shipments in September. So kind of mid-September, they'd like to fill their warehouses and start to stock shelves. Uh, so you're going to start to see revenue, and that's why it's important to have you know a supply and have you know inventory built up, which we've been doing mm -hmm. um, both on the you know on the dried flower perspective as well as um, you know the oil side. And, and we also are doing something very unique. We um, you know I think we've only seen announcements of one or two other companies uh, working with a company on a custom-made uh, bespoke uh, pre-roll machine that's going to that's going to be capable that is capable of producing up to 8.5 million pre-rolls a year, hmm. uh, and is also has downstream packaging as well in a child-resistant form. So, I think you know being prepared for that, having everything in place. It's not about just what you can produce, but you've got to be able to package it and have it labeled and ready for the market. So. Sure. So, is the model generally with the liquor control agencies and the whatever the alternatives are? Is it generally? COD, you ship the product, they receive it, they pay for it, or they pay in advance, or do they pay once it's sold? Uh, no, primarily it's all pre 
prepayment oh, certainly. Okay, so great. you're paying at the time that when you ship. I mean, there's terms associated with that, as sure. you would see with any, as almost like a consumer package good. So mm -hmm. those terms are typically 30 days kind of uh, payment. Um, you know, and there are some slight differences in terms of distribution, in terms of are you shipping directly to a warehouse, or are you shipping? You know, for example, we're based in Moncton, uh, so for New Brunswick, we're going to be shipping directly to the each of the 20 stores that they have up and running. But beyond that, in most places, we're shipping to a central warehouse. So hmm. uh, it's a great partnership for us yeah. with NB. Um, you know the province of New Brunswick. So. Sure, and then on the other side of the premium flower spectrum is you, your investment in Hyacinth, and I'm really interested in Hyacinth and what they're doing because if they are able to provide all the whole range of profile of CBDs and THC as ingredients in you know micro sort of dosed uh, concentrations, then that's arguably a game changer for the whole industry in terms of edibles and vapes and whatnot. Yeah. So what is the progress there? Just yeah, so Hyacinth, uh, we expect that deal to close in the next month, so in okay. August. And uh, so for those of the, of the viewers not familiar with Hyacinth, they're a uh, biotech company based out of Montreal um, that are working on um, biofermentation, which is a proven methodology producing vitamins and insulin and other biological pharmaceuticals, where they're taking the gene that is, uh, you know, the precursor for Olivetol, which is a precursor for THC, CBD, CBG, and then through a proprietary enzymatic process fermenting that production and then converting through enzymes so you can actually get a pure THC or a CBD or CBG or potentially other cannabinoids as well right as, as mm. they continue to evolve so um, they've proven that at a lab scale the technology's proven at a production scale uh, so the next steps for them will be optimizing their process with a contract manufacturer and then having their own facility built out and you know this is potentially a very disruptive technology mm. right it's uh, we can pr produce you know hyacinth could be produced uh, cannabinoids at uh, pennies on the dollar in terms of plant-based and um, you know the advantage to that is that it's a very pure form could be used as an API in a pharmaceutical but also as you alluded to could be used in vaporizer pens or edibles or those sure. products um, and or you could mix it with a plant derived extract as well to kind of kind of get it some of that terpene mix and minor cannabinoids at the same time so exciting times we expect that deal to close in August and uh, they're a great partner and we look forward to uh, to working with them and with that agreement we can get up to 25% of the offtake at a discount um, to the market price. So uh, we're not the only uh, company they'll be supplying, but I think there's a huge market for them. Mm -hmm. And your interest in the company? Uh, so we haven't fully announced all the financial details. Okay. We'll be doing that once the agreement's okay. closed. So. so we'll keep our eyes peeled for that. <laughs> all right, Greg, that's a great update as usual. Congratulations on a great quarter, and we'll look forward to having you back soon. Okay, thanks, James. Hey, welcome back. Ed's back. I don't know if you notice Ed, the head, who's dead now, is back. Ed, anything to say for yourself? No, that's what I thought. <laughs> Anyways, I, I can amuse myself just pretending that this is Ed. I'll, I'm going to put words in his mouth. Anyways, let's uh, let's jump to the indexes because that's sort of what the one of the value propositions of this whole thing is supposed to be, right? Right? A little stock analysis in the cannabis sector. Uh, theoretically, yes, that is the case. Let's see, do I have my NDI up? Yes, I do. Okay, so I should not get yelled at by anybody. Do I have? No, I'm not up on that. All right. Anyways, so looking at the full screen of the, oh, this is the problem. We're on, I'm on Chrome. I need to be on Firefox. There we go. Okay, don't worry. I will get it together here shortly. Here's the index for the day. Everything is green. It's not that easy being green. Anyways, look at, look at this. What's going on? Does the summer doldrums end it? Is the summer sell-off over? Has everybody paid their first mortgage payment and down payment on their Muskoka mansion? We were here with Chris, Chris Wagner to a little bit earlier, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play that, roll that interview for you in one second, as soon as I learn how to start talking. And uh, Ed, Ed was pointing, or rather Chris was pointing out the fact that Ed, Ed's not pointing out anything. You'll notice he has no arms, hands, legs, or anything. It's just his head. Ed's head. Anyways, Chris and I were talking about the effect of, uh, of uh, you know, markets drifting, stocks selling off gradually over the summer. And uh, he coined the term the Muskoka effect. 
And I think we're going to use this going forward as our term to describe what happens when investors actually do sell in May and go away. And just to quickly touch upon that, we were noticing that over the last 15 years or so, if you look at the years in which there was a bull market, in other words, from January, call it from September to March, there was a lot of money made, then there will be a sell in May and go away mentality because people take money off the table in the summer and go away and spend it. And in years where the markets were in the crapper, ACA 2012, 13, 14, there was no difference between the middle of the year and the summer months because there was no money made by anybody. So nobody really went anywhere. Nobody went and bought new 200,000 square foot uh, stadium cottages up on Muskoka, if you will. Anyway, so quickly, let's look at the large caps here. Uh, we're up 16, we're up to six, 6,094 points, still way off of the, the highs earlier last month and still just starting to you know, recover from, I guess, this sell-off that began here. Now, I think what we're gonna see is the uh, accumulation phase resume is what I'm predicting. There will be an accumulation phase resuming the closer we get to the end of August because these stocks are going to be viewed as oversold. You're gonna to start to see the announcements coming out. Vic Newfeld's here to make an announcement tomorrow. I think it will be after his press release comes out, but we're going to be one of the first to poke and prod at Vic and say, what the real story with that, Vic? Anyways, I wasn't, oh, look at that. Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> Gotta throw that in there. What the hell, eh? Uh, what I wanted to look at was the individual stocks here, and let's see who's performing the best. Look at that. Aurora is up 2.35% today on, uh, oh, we don't have the share count open here. Let's take a look on, oh, what, a poultry, 6.6 .6 million shares traded. That's a light day, a very light day. Uh, Aurora's market cap now at 6.5 billion versus Canopy growth is still at 7.4 billion. That gap is closing, people. Will Aurora overtake Canopy as the largest cannabis company in the world by market capitalization? It remains to be seen. Okay, let's see who did what in terms of percentages. Best performer today, it's gotta happen once in a while, even a broken clock's right twice a day. MedMen, CSE listed MMEN, up 3.6% at 432, still struggling along in that range bound area between Call it 425 and five bucks. Kronos Group tacked on 3.26% up to 791. Also kind of laboring under the flat midsummer horizontal blues. Cantrest Holdings even got a little bit of a got caught a bit of a bid today for a change, which uh, Cantrest has been under siege lately. Though again, this company, the lower it goes, the more I feel it's undervalued relative to its peers. Boy, oh boy, all kinds of things popping up on my website. Anyways, we'll come back and look at some of the other stocks in just a bit. Now we're going to talk to Chris Wagner from Emerald Health. Hey, welcome back to Midas Letter Live. My guest in this segment is Chris Wagner. He's the CEO of Emerald Health Therapeutics, trading on the venture under the symbol EMH. Chris, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, James. Good to be here. Uh, Chris, Emerald Health is uh, certainly in the ring as far as the big battle for our market share goes with all of the ACMPR producers. Yeah. Um, most interestingly to me was the idea that, you know, you had this the press release came out with all of the BC companies that were going to be part of the BC retail. Emerald Health wasn't included, yeah. and then, so the stock sold off, and then you announced that, oh, actually, now we're included. Yeah. <laughs> and did yeah, this, yeah. the stock did not regain all of its lost ground, however, yet. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's interesting. We, we really, at Emerald, we have this focus on, um, we believe that people use cannabis for a purpose. So mm -hmm. we, you know, we think it's either for um, improving sleep or reducing anxiety or relaxing. And, and to be um, effective in providing products for that type of person, um, you need to have a very scientific focus to create brand new products. And so we, we focus a lot on that 
and making sure that we get deals with BC and other provinces and have very low cost supply. So the deal with BC, um, you know, there were 31 licensed producers who were announced that, that right. signed a deal with them. And uh, we did not until about a week later. And the reason we didn't was the first deal is not always the best deal. It's like the number one thing everybody learns in business school is you don't always take the first deal because it's right. not always the best deal. And so we didn't take the first deal. Right. Um, but we took the best deal. And, and so you know, a week later, we had that, that announcement. And I think it, you know, in terms of a, an Emerald shareholder, it is really beneficial to them um, and to the BC government that we did not take the first deal. I mean, we're one of the biggest... Uh, producers in in the country and we're certainly the biggest in BC and so we're gonna be a long-term supplier for the BC government okay and so you're uh, bigger in terms of uh, cannabis production than uh, canopies BC operations yeah quite a bit bigger so okay. we have um, we have a million square feet um, uh, in Delta on a, on a five million square foot um, uh, footprint. Oh, that's through the deal with Village Farm. Exactly, right. And so we actually just on Monday received, uh, it actually came on Friday, but we announced it on Monday, the um, uh, license to sell out of that facility. Hmm. Um, so that is a massive uh, production facility. And you know, the, 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 the people from BC, the government, the BCLDB and other uh, provincial buyers have toured our facilities and every time they do that, they come back and they say, this is amazing. This is one of the most high tech high quality operations in the country and we want to do business with you. And so that, that was also part of the, um, the deal with BC as we brought them out and they had a nice tour. And, uh, right. Interesting. So then you've also signed a definitive agreement to acquire Northern Vine Canada, which you've already owned 65% of. Uh, what is Northern Vine's value proposition? Yeah, so, so Emerald Health Therapeutics is a licensed um, producer in LP. Mm -hmm. So we grow and cultivate and sell. Uh, Northern Vine we now own 100% of and it's a licensed dealer. Uh, it's a horrible name for, uh, for, for a, a company or license, but what it allows them and now us to do is uh, import. Um, so we are allowed to import oils uh, for medical purposes and we're also allowed to um, experiment and combine things with cannabinoids that other licensed producers are not allowed to do. So mm -hmm. it, it gives us a very broad range to develop brand new innovative products that other groups might not be able to do. And, th and that's a big part of where Emerald's going. Okay. Intellectual property, brand new products. And so owning 100% of Northern Vine really gives us a leg up there. Sure. So your announcement uh, yesterday in, of the 50-50 joint venture with Pure Sun Farms, that's mm -hmm. not Village Farms. Yeah, so, we, so Village Farms and Emerald um, together have formed a company called Pure Sun Farms. Oh, okay. So okay. we each own half of it. Right. Um, and not another million square feet. No, no, same, <laughs> same, uh, sa same one. Okay, and, that's good. And the value proposition there is, you know, um, Village Farms has uh, 750 years of growing experience. We have an equivalent on the biotechnology, life sciences side. So what a great mm -hmm. uh, combination. Um, and so we work on that together and it's been amazingly Amazingly fast, actually, the, the conversion of that facility. There were tomatoes growing in that facility seven months ago. Mm -hmm. So we went from zero to fully licensed, fully able to sell product in seven months. Whoa. It's fast, and yeah. it's big and green in there right now. So it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing to see. That's great. Um, then, so is it safe to say that Emerald Health is more focused on the medicinal side of cannabis than it is the recreational side? We actually look at them, uh, those two markets, very similarly. We think that whether you're a medical patient or a recreational pa patient, you take cannabis for a purpose, mm -hmm. and you that whatever that purpose is, if it's to relax recreationally or it's medicinal, you need to get some sleep, you want a consistent outcome every single time. Mm -hmm. And so that's our approach. Our approach is consistency and quality so you get this predictable outcome. And we're going to back that up with... Um, with patented products and also um, running clinical studies to demonstrate that if you really do want to improve your sleep, that we have products that are demonstrate, we can demonstrate those outcomes in a quantitative way. And I, I think clinically. Clinically, yeah. Mm. And even, even from a, you know, and you can really only do that if you're, if you're a life science focused sure. company. If you don't, if, you, if you've never done that before, it's really hard to do, to, even to think about doing these kind of clinical studies that demonstrate, hey, I, I wanted to relax. And there's actually scales, there's validated scales that measure relaxation. I wanted to relax. I took Emerald's product, this was the outcome, mm -hmm. and published in, in journals, and, 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 and that's a really good way to actually um, 
market and create a brand awareness around these products. It's not just a flashy product with nice signage. It's it's it is that and it has evidence supporting its use. Hmm. Yeah, the interesting thing about life sciences is, uh, you know, people say, well, this is a bubble and it's going to go away because, you know, as soon as it's everywhere, there'll be a few big ones. And but then when you look at if you know, people like to control it broadly to the uh, deprohibition of alcohol, mm. which had apart from some very basic utilitarian uses, alcohol was purely recreational. That's right. Yeah. As whereas cannabis, the recreational component is really the, just the smallest little part of it. Because yeah. if you look at the licensing by the FDA of uh, epileptrol from mm -hmm. GW Pharma, mm -hmm. that's really indicative that there could be a, a, to a complete avalanche of new yeah. sort of patented molecules coming out of the CBD complex. And so I guess Emerald Health, yeah. this is my long-winded wind-up for you, <laughs> Emerald Health is looking to capture that opportunity based on the fact that you're basically a life sciences company more so than a cannabis company. We, we believe the Canadian recreational market is a good market. We're going to participate in that, but it is only just the beginning. Our objective is to have multi-billion dollar products that are patented that we will sell all over the world, and it won't be in recreational markets. It's going to be in medical markets in you know Australia, Germany, and so on. Um, uh, all over the world, mm -hmm. and so that 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 is the objective, and you summarized it uh, nicely. Mm. Well, that's great. Um, then, so in terms of catalysts for shareholders or investors considering Emerald Health right now, what mm -hmm. is the runway for the rest of 2018 look like, and what's the first part of 2019 look like? Well, you're going to start to see uh, a whole lot of sales coming out of uh, out of us selling into this market. You're going to start to see um, some announcements around some of the patenting of brand new products we've been doing. You're going to see our brand being rolled out to Canadians. Canadians will know who Emerald Health Therapeutics is. I can guarantee you that. Uh, you're going to see the launch of uh, Emerald Health Naturals, which is a uh, company that we've started that will sell non-cannabis products in grocery stores and pharmacies all across the country. Uh, so you're going to see a lot, and it's all happening very, very soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's great. Um, tell you what, that's a great catch-up then, Chris. Let's leave it there for now. We'll come back to you again in a quarter's time and see how the plan is unfolding. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, James. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so what do you think about that? Emerald Health looks like it's uh, got quite a bit going on for it. Um, I wanted to take a moment here and quickly acknowledge some of our viewers who are watching on Facebook. Hello to Chris Little, Corey Fitzgerald, Chris Little. <laughs> now I'm reading the comments. Uh, Matthew Weber wants to, is asked if Emerald Health uh, holds the patents. And that's a good question. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I will find out though. That's a good question. Um, looking over, over onto YouTube, we've got a lot of our regular folks here. Mr. Lou1990, how's it going, James? How's it going, Mr. Lou1990? Erski says, happy lunch. Thank you, I did have a happy lunch. Uh, and Plato Ed, greeting shout out to Plato Ed. Hear that, Ed? They're, they're rooting for you. Mr. Pacino says, uh, hello, Mr. West, I need to do this more often. More often than, well, we didn't do it yesterday, but that's because it was the tail end of a long weekend. No, I know it wasn't a long weekend officially anywhere, but I had a long weekend because I had a long week, so I made it a long weekend. I went to Niagara, and I traveled from winery to restaurant to winery to restaurant, and essentially drank way too much wine, but got some exercise while I was at it. The bottom line is I was so tuckered out yesterday, mm -mm, couldn't string a sentence together to save my life. Anyways, let's see. Mr. Lou1990 wants to know, what are my thoughts on blow? Not the drug, the stock, Cannabis Technologies. What, what, what was I saying there? Whoa. Okay, let's pull up a chart and let's see if I can tell you what I think about blow. Now, the interesting thing about this company is the guy, one of the guys who founded it approached me at the PDAC in I think 2013 or 14 even, maybe even earlier, and asked me if I wanted to buy some cheap stock in this thing. And I said, I said no because I felt it was a conflict of interest. 
Don't ask me what I mean by that. I shall only, I shall only mislead you further. Anyways, but looking at this chart now, if I was a betting man, I'd say that nobody could sell any stock. Okay, wait a sec. This is the five-day look. That's not fair. Let's go one year. All right, so I guess this is where it finally went public by the looks of things. And it's been up as high as, woo, 355. Wow, 370. It opened at 370 not so long ago in January. Of course, everything was up in January, so that's not really fair. Today, it's up on 9.2 million shares traded to $1.64. What's going on? Interestingly enough, they put out a press release that says, unaware cannabis technologies comments on Bill C-46 and is unaware of any material change. That was yesterday's press release. Let's have a quick sniff at this. The workplace provides the following statement related to the government's of Canada's authorization of roadside. Ah, okay. So this is why the stock is taking off because Bill C-46 has obviously uh, been authorized, uh, has authorized roadside testing of saliva in drivers to test for the presence of cannabinoids. And Cannabix makes the only cannabis testing device that we know of. Uh, and so obviously the shares, the stock is up, 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 up and away on that news. And that makes perfect sense. What do I think of the company in the long term? Let's see. What do we got here? 97 million shares out. Um, trading at a buck 67. That buck 77 rather. I don't have an opinion because I don't know enough about the company. I mean, if they've got the only roadside device that police are going to use, then uh, sounds like a buy to me, but uh, we're not entirely sure that that has been approved. Their device has been approved and accepted by the police as effective. So that's the, that's the show me moment that has yet to happen in that thing. If you know otherwise, please, please feel free to make a comment to that effect. Uh, let's see, what else? Other hellos out to Axes and Alcohol, who says he's liking my thoughts on Molson Coors. Earlier I, I opined, I speculated, I, I, I averred the potentiality that tomorrow when Vic Newfeld comes in here and sits in that chair, it won't be stone miniature Vic, it'll be real Vic. Uh, Vic is going to talk about his big news of the day tomorrow, which I surmise might have something to do with Molson Coors and Afria and some kind of a, oh, could be. Could be, we shall see. Uh, let's see, how are LPs supposed to compete with the black market when black market is selling an ounce for 50 to $100 for AAA to quadruple A and LPs sell the same quality for $300 plus an ounce? This is a question from an individual who has as their somewhat unimaginative handle, KGV1776 WASP. Maybe that is imaginative and I'm just not picking it up. Anyways, how are LPs supposed to compete? Let's see. The police in Ontario, at least, I know are going to start shutting down dispensaries. They've already raided a few. Uh, there's a few that have closed ahead of the raids. We're actually going to go out on the street with a camera and try to talk to some of these dispensary guys in the, in the days ahead here. here there's, there's a wild card for you, Fraser. I bet you didn't know that was happening. Fraser's our producer and... Uh, no, we've had no conversation about that. It's just the idea inspired by that question. Uh, yeah, so how are they supposed to compete? They can't. That's why they're going to have to put them out of business to win. There you go. They're going to be put out of business and then it's going to be, I don't know, it's going to be a constitutional quagmire in the court system of Canada, I suspect. Anyways, moving right along, let's see. Big bids on Afria. Well, that's because we're talking about them here on Midas Letter. No, just kidding. Probably Molson guys run front running the deal. Oh, no, just kidding. Can't say that. Uh, no, who knows why there's big bids on Afria. Maybe some people know something we don't. Or maybe we do know and we're just pretending we don't. Who knows? All right, Ersky. Ersky, what have you got to say for yourself here? LPs don't have quadruple A+. plus. That's a reference to the quality. Now, let's see. I have had no fantastic cannabis dried flower experience from any cannabis 
dispensary that was not licensed. I can tell you that. If you know of some dispensary on the illegal side that is selling primo, and I mean primo, dried flour, I would like to know because I would like to go try it out and I would also like to have it tested by my friends at Anandia Labs to see what the pesticide content is, the pathogen content from like molds, mildews, etc. And let's start testing this stuff relative to the ACMPR guys and see if there actually is a difference. Oh, everybody's going to love that. Boy, what happened? The CEO stopped coming to my show because I started testing, <laughs> testing dispensaries. No, that might be harder to do. Erski says, can I please tell Ed to stop moving? Ed, stop moving. Nobody's going to know what that means. Um, so anyways, we have uh, one more segment that we're going to do here. And we're going to talk to our good friend Justin B. Marshall out on the West Coast in about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to take some more questions as I see them pile in here, assuming anybody has any questions. Um, somebody asked me to uh, opine on Canopy Growth's Ontario retail strategy. And here's my opinion. They're the biggest. They have the biggest presence. They probably have more products than anybody else will have in the LCBO system. However, now with our new premier, Doug Ford, stating that he is going to privatize cannabis sales, all bets in Ontario are off because first of all, it's unclear at this point as to how easily he can just wave his government wand and declare private sales open to the cannabis vendors. Secondly, it's unclear as to how fast, assuming he could just wave that magic wand and make it so, that it could actually happen. Don't forget the government has probably signed leases now with over 40 locations in Ontario for long-term Ontario cannabis stores. So if Doug's going to try to back all that stuff up without any further thought, he might find himself facing a number of lawsuits from growers who are otherwise already had a contract with the OCB. Thirdly, I think if the Ontario treasurer was to say to Doug, 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 remember the reason that we legalized cannabis in part was because of the tax opportunity inherent in being the monopoly vendor of cannabis in Ontario. And so would they be able to capture as much tax if cannabis was sold privately? That is an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. I kind of doubt it. I kind of doubt it. Um, remember now, the government's going to be under pressure to keep the overall cost of cannabis to retail buyers lower than LPs, or rather not LPs, but illegal cannabis dispensaries who do not have the financial burden of compliance with either the ACMPR or the Narcotics Control Act or the securities regulators because they're not going to be public companies. So it's going to be 100% incumbent upon law enforcement to shut down completely illegal dispensaries in order for the LPs to make any money selling cannabis because of the tax load that's going to be put on it by the provincial and federal governments. So that whole foo is yet ahead for us to all observe and watch and you can obviously cast your vote with who you buy your cannabis from. Um, personally, I am not going to, I, like I say, I haven't actually found any illegal dispensaries that I could say unequivocally had great product on a consistent basis. Uh, my mind is open though, I'm open to trying it. And, uh, but I'm looking forward to like being able to walk into Shoppers Drug Mart on my way home and pick up a pack of pre-rolls and burn one on the sidewalk on my way home. That's going to be great. Um, let's see. Sproutly halted the last couple days. What are your thoughts on their technology regarding their water solubility compared to others? Have you dove into the compatibles? Okay, first of all, Sproutly is a client of our media production division, so we're going to be producing some pretty cool media for them. So obviously my viewpoint should be considered biased based on that. They're partially going to be paying my, my bills here. So, um, but what do I think of their technology? First of all, I lack the scientific background to really truly evaluate the difference between an actual water soluble at the molecular level cannabis product versus a wa merely water miscible product 
Both of those terms were more or less foreign to me until I had the conversation with Dr. Arup Sen yesterday. However, uh, I don't think there's much doubt that I've tried a bunch of cannabis infused products and so far they all come across with the cannabis oil taste in them. That includes beers and uh, energy drinks that people have sent me. Um, you know, now you compare that to say a brewed cannabis beer that my friend Duma Winchu is producing over at Province Brands, that did not have a cannabis flavor per se, it had a beer flavor. Um, so I think if you want to put cannabinoids into uh, aqueous solutions and have them actually dissolved and not just mixed, I think, I think that their technology could be something special. I think it could drive the company to a crazy valuation. Um, the question is, are they going to be able to defend their intellectual property if others come up with the same idea and represent to do it a different way, yet they're infringing on the patent? I mean, look at some of the patent wars we've seen where even Apple and, this, um, and Samsung, for example, take years to get to a resolution in that. So, you know, I think it's a great idea. I think that probably the quality of products made with a water-soluble solution is going to be way better than one that's merely water miscable. But again, we'll see. I don't know enough about it. Um, I think that's why they're halted, is because they're going to announce the, uh, probably the final thing, though I've had no definitive intelligence or advice on that. Uh, let's see. Yes, Freedom Unleashed, my pleasure. I love to be thanked in real time. It's very confusing, though. I feel like I'm talking to a live studio audience that's not here. Okay. Let's see, what do we got here? Okay, let's go see what else anybody has to say. What do I think of TGIF? TGIF was founded by a friend of mine named David Stadnick, and uh, I don't believe I was ever a shareholder. I'm not now. Um, I know that they are vying for market share in the, Euro in the uh, European, in the US markets, and they started off in Vegas, they tried to buy body and mind. That whole thing went sideways somehow. Honestly, in, in, in totality, I gotta say, I don't really have an opinion about TGIF, but let's go take a look at their chart. Maybe I can form an opinion on the fly here. Let's see. See, this is the thing. Here's proof of our credibility is the fact that we're willing to perhaps call out a stock that is, uh, is not doing so well. So let's go look into the Google rather the Google, the Midas letter stock machine, TGIF, CSE listed, survey says, da 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 da, 38 cents, ooh, that's an ugly chart. There's an ugly chart. There's no two ways about it, that's an ugly chart. If Ed was here, what would Ed say? That's an ugly chart, that's all I have to say. Just saying, just saying, that's all Ed would say. Full screen, uh, yeah. That's an ugly chart, all right. There's abdication of faith across the board here. Volumes are drying up and the selling continues. Little spike here on, let's see, was there any news? Let's go smaller. Have a look, last news, July 24th, receives permit for hemp processing facility. Okay, well, you know, here's an interesting thing. These hemp processing facilities, if cultivators in the US are allowed to start extracting CBD from hemp grown outdoors, the cost of production on a per unit basis of CBD is going to be somewhere around a penny or less. That's the bottom line there. So all these companies that are able to source their CBD for their CBD products from hemp grown outdoors, and remember there's no qualitative difference between a CBD from an outdoor grown hemp and a CBD from a, from a high THC indoor ultra high tech plant, there is no difference. CBDs are CBDs. So that could be a big game changer for them. Um, the trick is going to be how do you get that into consumer packaged good and find the distribution channels and the shelf space so that people are actually buying it. That's the big show me moment in this whole consumer packaged goods play. Remains to be seen, remains to be seen. Okay, uh, 359. I'm going to, we're going to now find out what's going on in California with my friend and fellow cannabis commentator now, Justin B. Marshall. Shoot, I don't have a computer in front of me. Hey 
Hey, welcome back to Midas Letter Live. My guest this segment is Dr. Sen from Sproutly. Dr. Sen, thanks for joining me today. You are welcome. Thank you for the time. So, yeah, obviously that was not our friend Justin B. Marshall. We had a slight mix-up in the production facility over yonder, for which we shall be administering shots of tequila against their will until they turn green and puke all over their shoes. Anyways, what we wanted to do was show you this clip from our friend Justin B. Mark. Oh, actually, wait, you know what? I'm going to babble nonsensically for five more minutes because that's how much time it's going to take to set that one up. Sorry. Actually, you know what we're going to do? Usually I know it's 420 before we pull out the product of the day, but here we have a gift package from 48 North. And now who I'm going to consider my good friend, Alison Gordon, who was here last week. Um, you can probably find her video. She sent me this really cool care package from 48 North. It comes, has a booklet in it, and I don't know what you have to do to get one of these, but it tells the 48 North story. Rather beautiful, rather beautiful. And uh, what did she send me? She sent me this very cool little incense burning cradle, which I really like. I mean, I don't really burn a lot of incense, but... Uh, I'm going to burn one right now. Oh, wait, maybe we can't. No, I don't think we can in this building. Hmm. Can we burn incense in here, do you think, without getting in trouble? Nobody has an opinion on that, so I'm essentially talking to myself. What do you think, Ed? You got an opinion? Anyways, this is what happens when your friend doesn't show up and you have to talk to his stone self. Did you, whoever knew that Ed could be so wise? Anyways. This, uh, this is not the product that we're demonstrating as our product of the day. This is something kindly provided by Allison Gordon at 48 North. But what we have here is some drops for the bathtub. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really take a lot of baths. Preferring as much as I can to just breeze through a shower, but Still, this thing, this is lavender infused uh, bath oil. So it's called, oh no, that's not it. Anyways, it is uh, a very lavendery smelling product and it's got hemp in it. So I imagine it has some relaxing effects because of the CBD content as a result of the hemp. And these are, one of the many products I'm imagining that 48 North is going to have available. So there you go. Not all cannabis products are going to get you high. Woo. All right. So uh, there's the product of the day. Here's the little gift package from Allison. I'm going to put that away. Go check out 48 North at 48north.com to learn more about this company. It's the, uh, Probably the only company that really has a strong uh, sort of women focus, which is, hey, that's fantastic. Okay, let's go back and look at some of our stocks here on the Midas letter CSE, Canadian Cannabis Index. Uh, the CSE Index is all companies listed in Canada on the CSE. Uh, we've got... Let's see, it's, they're listed by market cap. So the big loser of the day, Health Space Data Systems at four cents. Boy, we don't even usually look at stocks so those lows. Look at that, High Hampton Holdings down five cents to 54 cents. Boy, oh boy, that was our friend David Argudo, but we're gonna uh, pray for recovery, pray for rain as they say. Let's look at the stocks that went up instead. Okay, so Abatis Bioceuticals up 22% to 14 cents. Eh. Puff Ventures up on their news, 9 cents to 58. That's a good thing. Isodial. Isodial up 45 cents. That is the big money maker of the day right there. We're going to find out why their stock went up. We're going to invite them for an interview, Suzanne, right? Yes. Yes, we are. All right, are we ready to roll with Justin? Okay. Five more minutes. Some of these other stocks that we don't know a thing about. Koyos Beverage Company. We're going to go check out their newsroom on Midas Letter. 
And if you haven't checked out the Midas Letter uh, cannabis section, it's really got some cool functionality that you guys should check out. You can, every single cannabis stock has a newsroom where we have the chart, all of their trading data, plus all of the articles that we've written on them ahead of all their press releases. But ahead of all the press releases with all of those fluffy non-press releases that have been showing up in news feeds lately, they're all taken out. We edit anything that is out, not anything that is not company distributed from the news release section because they are the only ones who are putting out news. There's a price history feature here, which gives you the ability to sort of run a price analysis. There's a historical trading, and uh, and that's essentially that's what we got. That's what we got. Did I tell you that's what we got? So Coyos Beverages. 18 cents, you don't know anything about them. Let's see what their last press release says. Introduces first flavor of new line of reformulated drinks. Okay, this doesn't say anything about uh, being a CBD product. So, perhaps these guys are here by mistake. They're a functional beverage company. Whoa, wait a sec. MCT oil. Okay, well, like I said, we don't know anything about this company. So let's look at, let's try to find one we do know something about. Okay, I'm going to pull up a company here. Now here's a company which I own something like 700,000 crazy shares. And uh, they, so this company is not the one I own shares in. This company announced it was going to take over Canicure, a private company which I have shares. And that, there's a two-week due diligence window here where we're going to wait and see if that happens. So that's a deal that I think if it gets done could, could put Canicure and Heritage on the map in terms of real contenders. There are some, uh, you know, there's, there, at this point there's a strategy yet to be articulated. Uh, we're not sure on where the capital, who's going to raise the money, or where they're going to get it. So all these things remain to be seen. But again, I will be following this because I have a vested interest. Anyways, what else we got here? Let's look at Oxley. Here's Oxley. 80 cents. Where are they at today? That was yesterday. 84 cents, so up slightly. So interestingly, all of the indexes are up slightly. Except, let's see. The large cap Canadian cannabis index is up 2.09%. That's pretty cool. But all the indexes are up slightly besides that one. That one's up the most. So if you haven't already watched Allison's interview with me on Friday, you should check it out because it was lots of fun. And she is a very interesting and articulate lady. And I really enjoy her company so much so that we're going to give her her own show. Um, another piece of content we put up last week that was really an eye-popping eye-opener for me was that Matt Bottomley from Canaccord, who's their analyst, told me that Canicure or Canaccord was, uh, or rather Aurora Cannabis, was going to be, he had a target on it of $11 per share. Now this is a company trading at $7 per share, so that's like, that's a pretty, uh, pretty ballsy statement, but he made he made a great case for it, so if you haven't already checked out that video, be sure to do so. Are you guys good to go in there yet with, with Justin? It's only at 60%. I had to re-outload it. Oh. Uh, but somebody wants to know the top three U.S. cannabis picks. Top three U.S. cannabis picks. Are those U.S.? Um, like an I and this. Oh, okay. Top three U.S. cannabis picks. Let me see. Let me see. Now, I'm assuming that the reference is to Canadian listed companies that have U.S. cannabis exclusively. My number one pick, I would have to say, is going to be Liberty Health Sciences, LHS, on the CSE. The reason for that pick is because it is essentially a proxy for Afria's U.S. moves. And so, essentially, if you thought about Afria positioning in the United States, that's what Liberty Health is going to be doing on behalf of Afria as soon as federal prohibition ends in the United States on cannabis. Afria will gain control of 
Liberty Health and wouldn't be surprised if we even saw them merge, but that's why I like, that's my number one. Number two, U.S. Play. You know, I'm going to say it's High Hampton, and the reason I'm going to say High Hampton is because David Argudo has become a good friend of mine, uh, is a very connected guy in the U.S. cannabis space, and uh, he has big plans for the company, and the company has... Uh, a great team behind it who have a demonstrated ability to raise lots of capital and uh, they are not bad on the promotional front though they tend to squander a lot of dollars with less effective promotional groups I don't know why when here I am you know ah. anyways uh, so but they're still my number two no they're not a client no I don't any, own any shares um, let's see and number three in the US side of things Actually, you know, they might be considered my number one uh, because, again, they're a client, so my, my opinion must be considered colored or biased, but CanX Capital Corp, C-N-N-X on the CSE, is definitely in the top three. And the main reason for that is because I was in California visiting Jetty Extracts uh, two weeks ago. Jetty Extracts products are in over 600 dispensaries throughout California. California is the biggest market within North America. And so I think once, uh, once the lethargy gets shaken out of the market and the sell-off is over and people start to look for companies that are underperforming, uh, I think that Canex is going to be one. Let's take a look at Canex's shares right now, actually, because I'm interested to see how they're doing. Um, yeah, we're going to have a video out on Jetty Extracts probably next week, Fraser? Yeah, probably midweek. Midweek next week. We'll have the Jetty Extracts. And we shot this um, on uh, RE cameras. And if you don't know about cinematic camera gear, RE cameras are among the top cameras in the world. They're what 90% of Hollywood films are shot on these days. And so the, 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 the imagery will be spectacular. But not just that, the sort of the, what you're going to see at Jetty Extracts is also spectacular. Okay, so Canex is down 84 cents, and it's been in the slow summer drift of the market without any catalysts to drive it north. I can tell you that one of the catalysts we're waiting for is the completion of the transaction to acquire 100% of Jetty Extracts. And so... We're going to, that's probably making Canex a real buying opportunity now. So number three in the U, let's, let's not say one, two, and three in the U.S. My top three U.S. picks, Canex Capital, uh, High Hampton, and what was my third one again? Uh, boy, oh boy, Mental Block kicks in. Canex, and what was the first one I said? Can't remember. Nobody can remember. Every, even the people in, the, even the people in the control room have gone blank. Thank God it's not just me. It's them too. Liberty Health. Liberty Health. Thank you. Oh my gosh. By, like I said, I'll say it again. Byproduct of long-term cannabis use is short-term memory loss. What was I saying? Anyways, here's Justin B. Marshall reporting from Monterey, California. <laughs> Welcome back to Minus Letter Live again. In this segment, we have coming to us live from California, from Monterey County, California, Big Sur uh, Dispensary with our West Coast correspondent, Justin B. Marshall. Gentlemen, how's it going out there today? Nice to see you again. Beautiful Ed, day out nice here. to see you again, James. Thanks. Hey. Thanks. So sure. tell me, uh, what is, uh, what's, what's the story here? What's going on today on the West Coast, Justin? Uh, things are beautiful. It's been quite warm down here. So we're cooling out in Big Sur Can of Botanicals. It's one of the nicest dispensaries I've seen in California so far. And I'm with the owners today, Aram Stoney and John DeFloria. Good afternoon. Guys. Hey, guys. How are you doing? 
How you doing? Great to be here. Thanks for having nice us. Nice to see you. So uh, tell me about your dispensary. Who are your customers? What kind of products do you sell? <laughs> Who are our customers? Well, uh, we sell a lot of uh, products here at our, our dispensary. Our customers really, uh, really are a wide range. We, we service a, a, a very, uh, you know, a community with a lot of older populations. So we're fortunate enough to be able to... Um, you know, provide the needed medicine that, that these folks need, and and uh, we have a, a large tourist population coming through as well. So a lot of visitors from around the country and really around the world. So uh, you know, it's a pretty diverse mix of people coming through. How long have you been operating this dispensary? Our dispensary, uh, the physical location, has been open since uh, September of last year. Uh, we did have a delivery service that we operated since 2014, and uh, we also uh, were fortunate to uh, have a cultivation site uh, in Monterey County before they decided to ban outdoor grows, so we're still kind of working on getting that back on. But our delivery service operated and, and uh you know, again, since 2014, and that really turned more into a consultation service as, as you know, more than product delivery. And, uh, you know, it's been quite the ride to get here to the physical location. But uh, fortunate to be here now and, and servicing our community. Huh. So if I come down there, is, can I buy, like, uh, can I buy hash? Can I buy vapes? <laughs> you can. We have really all, all the products. You know, right now with the current California regulations, uh, product supply has been a little more limited than what we're used to, uh, so the, the concentrates seem to be getting uh, hit the hardest. But yes, hash, vapes, uh, flour, as as the natural uh, product is is called now, it used to be buds or, or you know, I, I don't know, a thousand different words, but it, it's considered flour and uh, wonderful topicals and edibles, capsules, uh, tinctures are are a big. Uh, um, product that we sell a lot of so um, you, you name it we, we try to carry it. Do you find that because you're catering to an older audience that the uh, the sort of the preference is towards CBD uh, heavy products as opposed to THC heavy products? I would say yes and no I mean the, 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 the truth is that you need a little bit of both uh, CBD and THC, you know, to to be effective, but uh, but yeah, a lot of people are still nervous coming in. Uh, you know, they have they've either never had cannabis before, or uh, they're hearing great things about the CBD product. So it, you know, it's really tailored to the individual's needs. Uh, where you know, and and we try to determine if it's a higher CBD product that that's going to be more suited for them, or something with some kind of ratio, which you know can be. From a 30 to 1, you know, 30 parts CBD to 1 part THC, all the way down, you know, to like a 1 to 1 even ratio. Now, let's so, th can you go 30 to 1 the other way? Like, can you, is it? <laughs> well, I would just say, yeah, it's yeah, mostly, mostly, yeah, a lot of the products have, you know, little bits of, of CBD in them when they are a high THC product. But, uh, yeah, I guess the answer would be yes to that. So, the, the, one of the big questions that I see debated a lot in the cannabis media, and a lot of the debate seems somewhat uninformed. Uh, let's talk about that for a second. Why, what is the relationship between CBD and THC? Why is it important to have both if you're going to try to capture some of the beneficial effects of cannabis? Yeah, well, it's a great and I think really loaded question. Uh, the, you know, the science isn't fully there i would really have to say honestly but the, but the little bit of science that is there is just showing that the little bits of thc even if it's a you know one percent to the 99 percent helps to activate you know the cannabinoid receptors that are that are in our body naturally in our endocannabinoid system so there's just uh, you know the preliminary studies are just showing that that just it just works better and beyond that i think you'd have to get uh, you know one of the scientists coming uh, you know, either out of, uh, you know, Israel, it seems to be doing uh, most of the studies, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's just kind of what seems to work. And, and all, all the people coming through and, and having their testimonials, it just uh, shows that, you know, you take one product that's, you know, solely CBD, and then you take a one that's a little bit with the THC enhancement in there, it just seems to be more effective. So. Huh. Can you get a, can you get a plant? 
that has no THC and just CBD or vice versa? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, hemp would be considered that plant, and, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, people out there deriving products from the hemp plant, and, you know, it, it's difficult to, to really speak on that, um, you know, from a, a, a completely knowledgeable position because there's so much controversy right now in the hemp CBD versus uh, cannabis CBD. The, the truth is, once you isolate, you know, CBD either from hemp or from cannabis, you can't tell the difference. But you know, again, the belief is that a whole plant extract is really, you know, the the, the best medicine that you can get. So that's interesting because I have definitely experienced that when you go to some of these labs and they deconstruct, you know, cannabis into its constituent parts and oils and terpenes and everything, and then try to reconstitute it into a customized product. I find that, okay, this is interesting, but I have yet to encounter such a sort of, uh, you know, improvised cannabis product to come anywhere near the whole oil or the whole bud uh, in terms of just the quality of experience, both psychotropically and physically. Right. That yeah, you, and you bring up terpenes. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great things in there that, that you mentioned, and, and it's, it's, you know, really that there's just a lot of science that needs to continue and, and you know you guys in Canada are really leading the way with federal legalization it's going to open up those doors I believe uh, we, we hope that our government will pay attention and, and listen down here so that you know the true you know studies and the true science can be done uh, so that there can kind of be you know it, it, it can be said once and for all you know what what the truth is again we can tell from numerous testimonials seeing it on a daily basis that, that cannabis is, is truly a wonderful medicine and, and it, it's healing people it helps it works uh, we also believe that you know it's not it's not just for healing and medicine it, it's you know uh, to enhance just daily lives uh, you know from other perspectives so uh, but yeah the studies uh, uh, need to continue yeah, very good all right well uh, so where exactly are you located uh, we're located in Carmel, California, in a location called the Barnyard at the mouth of the valley on the way to uh, beautiful Big Sur. I've heard that your uh, part of the world there is really quite spectacular from a natural beauty perspective. Yeah, we enjoy it a lot. We have lots of uh, beautiful beaches and mountains and uh, golf courses. A nice uh, racetrack nearby Laguna Seca and um, lots of great shopping and art galleries if uh, you're into that sort of thing. Interesting. Um, one of the other things that I've heard com being complained about in uh, Florida recently is the 40% the tax that has come into existence on the retail price of cannabis since January. Is that something that people are pretty much up in arms about? Yeah, well, here in California, it's, uh, you know, it varies from, you know, municipality to municipality that there's, uh, you start off with the, you know, California set up a 15% excise tax, which uh, is, you know, goes to everybody. Uh, and then depending on your, your uh, state, you know, tax that we 7.75% here in Monterey County, uh, and then our local uh, cannabis tax our local county cannabis tax. They actually just reduced by a percentage. They started off at 5%, so now it's down to 4%. So we're at 26.75% total tax. And, and yes, that increases uh, the overall price of things, but it's not just the tax at the retailer that's you know increasing prices. It's, it's the tax from seed to sale. So uh, the grower is being taxed, the manufacturer is then being taxed. Uh, as well as the distributor being taxed. So by the time it's gotten to the sales floor, it's already incurred a, you know, a taxation at its finest. Um, but what I will say about the taxes is that you are getting, you know, the, the, the government set it up so that everything has to be tested. And so you are paying for a product that you know is safe. You know, it's free of pesticides, free of residual solvents, um, you know, just, just a safer product to consume. So. I think a lot of people will, will find that it's worth that, um, but at the same time, you know, it, it does seem like a lot. Uh, but that being said, also, prices 
you know, I've also kind of come down on the subtotal level. So, you know, it is hurting maybe some of the businesses coming in. Uh, you know, I don't think it's fully being reflected uh, to the consumer because we're eating a lot of those costs as well. Right. Okay, guys. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. We're going to come down and see you guys pretty soon. And yeah. I guess, Justin, you're going to show us around. And we're going to meet that's these cool. guys in person and get to try their wonderful products. And uh, that will be wonderful. Hopefully spend a little afternoon on the beach there with the feet up and the maybe, toes maybe in the water. Maybe a little uh, surf sump action. A little surfing. Yes. Do you guys all surf? Yes. Uh, we are. I think uh, the cannabis community was rooted in surfing, we believe, out here in, in uh our area, so uh, we enjoy the waves. Oh, we had awesome. awesome. All That's right. why they call it reefer. Oh, this is, <laughs> That's right. Just can't get, can't get this humor written for you. <laughs> How would you like to come and take a tour of the dispensary? We'll show you some of the products. Want to show? Oh, right now? Sure. Okay. Right Let's right go now. for a walk. Let's go for a walk. <laughs> show us some products. Hey, you know what? That's a great idea. <laughs> Can we come? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's, let's go with these guys, eh? Let's, okay, we're going for a walk. Here we go. There they are. Oh, okay, phew. Okay. That was, uh, oh, okay, let's see. Big Sir. Hi. Hi. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Whoa, Vape Central. Wow, that's quite an array of product they have there. Yeah. Yeah, look at Boy, this. I'll say. Ooh. Looks like a lot of trouble going on in there. Looks like... Uh, oh, here's the heavy-duty stuff. Uh-oh, that's, that's under lock and key. <laughs> nuclear, <laughs> nuclear drawer. <laughs> only, only reference this pile if you don't have anywhere to be for the uh, next 20 hours. Yeah. Well, wait, why don't we have a fridge here with some liquid joy in it? Well, just, well October 18th, then. We'll get there. We'll get there. Look at that. They've even got the beginnings of plants going in there. Tissue culture. Thank you, guys. Hey, we'll thanks. be back. Come back to you soon. There's a clean exit. That was so That's clean. <laughs>
in the babblosphere of the uh, of the forums. And there are a lot of people speculating that there's going to be some announcement, something to do with Molson Coors and Afria, but we cannot categorically say that that is the case. So if you want to find out, you're going to have to tune in tomorrow. Anyways, that is our show for today. If you enjoyed it, please don't hesitate to like us or subscribe or all, any of all that nonsense. Actually, you don't have to. You can just show up whenever you want. Uh, Facebook, same thing. Facebook's actually banned us from advertising because we're deemed to be an advertiser of ca uh, cannabis paraphernalia. Can you believe that? We're not selling any paraphernalia here. Anyways, the, uh, yeah, that's our show for today. And Special Ed will be back here tomorrow. Not miniature stone Special Ed, but real Special Ed. And that will be special, let me tell you. Thanks for joining us today.